Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special Ask Me Anything. It's not Ask Me Anything. We just almost call this an ADA, Ask Destiny Anything uh, episode here where exclusively on, on LinkedIn and in our Helium 10 Elite group, and I think we might be broadcasting this on YouTube as well, but um, we wanted to, to talk to sellers about what are they concerned about with PPC because there's a lot of new fees that, are coming to Amazon. And so sellers are thinking about, all right, how am I going to afford increasing PPC costs? How am I going to offset some of these new fees that are coming? Well, some people are like, all right, well, you might need to buckle uh, down a little bit more on, on how you're managing your PPC. So we wanted to give a, a platform for our customers to go ahead and ask us questions on what are the best uh, strategies that we should be using when we're talking about Amazon advertising. So to do that, we have Destiny here from Better Media. Destiny, you're coming to us live from Florida now, right? I am, yes. Now, I mentioned Amazon advertising, but are you a Walmart advertising expert at all? <laughs> well, yeah, when you're born and raised there, you pick up a In few Bentonville, things. In Bentonville, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, so it, funny enough, I'm PackView at one point hosted a pretty big Walmart conference in like one of the brand new buildings. And it was a block away from where I used to live. And it wow. was one of my first Walmart conferences I've spoken at and presented at. And really the, the platforms are pretty similar. Um, Amazon's changed their, I meant Walmart changed their auction model to be more similar to Amazon's. They've taken a very similar roadmap in terms of placements, bids, and targeting. Slight differentiation in terms of how the algorithm works, but yeah, we, we manage Walmart and have pretty decent amount of experience there. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're definitely going to have you on a Walmart Wednesday, uh, maybe next month or the month after. So uh, guys, don't just uh, limit your questions to Amazon advertising. We can, we can go ahead and do some, some Walmart advertising. So well now, wasn't it? Up until recently, or maybe still, like Walmart didn't even have negative targeting in in advertising. Like you could not negative match a non performing keyword. I mean, that's just like insane to me. Yeah, it, it's funny because I feel like they took all of the pain points of Amazon and like immediately rolled them out into Walmart without actually maybe realizing like the incremental mechanics. Like we all know how long it took to officially get sponsored brands or sponsored display and things like that. And Amazon's or Walmart's like, here, take it now. We'll yeah. also give you a lot more data from a dashboard perspective and a category perspective, but these little levers you need to pull, we're not going to give you access to yet. Yeah. Oh, well, well, uh, they, they have a roadmap of what worked and didn't work for Amazon. So hopefully they'll, they'll innovate a little bit quicker. Yes. But, um, first question for you, uh, I see some questions already up here in the, um, uh, in the comments, but ha have you guys at better media at all, uh, dabbled in the new thing where you can take Amazon post and then like turn them into sponsored, I think it's sponsored brand ads. Uh, is it that you can do? You mean the Amazon boosted post, which makes it seem like a fun little Facebook feature where you can boost your post and then you click the yeah. button and it just turns it into a headline search ad. Yeah. It's a, uh, what, what's working and not working or is it, I mean, is it working? Like, is it something you would recommend people to, to look into? I think it's a good opportunity to make your systems more efficient. You know, if you've been investing in Amazon posts for the last year and you have a lot of content creative, you just push a button and it turns it into a sponsored brand ad. So in that level, I think it's a hundred percent beneficial, but it's not giving you more impressions on your post. It's not giving you unique inventory or real estate. So I think it's a little bit of a misnaming there. But it does make it efficient for getting custom images added to your sponsored brand ads. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Um, this first question, I'm not sure if this is enough information here, but uh, we've got a it says uh, we've got a product which costs six to seven dollars. I'm assuming, oh, the product itself costs. I was thinking that maybe the cost per click was six to seven dollars. The product costs six or seven dollars. PPC is costly as a result. The A cost is high. What is your recommendation? So maybe if we were to generalize this, yeah. How do you manage PPC for like cheaper, cheaper products? You don't have a lot of wiggle room here, right? If you lower your bid to 10 cents, you're not going to get impressions or sales. If you raise your bid, so you show up in the high traffic placements, you're not going to probably be able to afford the conversion rate. It's probably converting too low, right? 
So at the end of the day, the real answer is find a way to increase your price, whether it's by bundling or differentiating and adding more value to your product or improving your conversion rate to the point where maybe you convert at a 50 to 60%. And that's a listing thing, right? Make your listing so good that you're converting that high so you can afford PPC. Because the the easy answer is lower your bid, right? It's just an equation. But when you lower your bid, you sh don't show up in traffic. So you don't get any sales. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I sell some straws. And, and I, you know, like, I think the straws, like some of my straws are like, like $8. But yeah. you'd be surprised. Like, even I can have a pretty low A cost, even at like, you know, 50 cents a, a, a click and, yeah. and above. Because, you know, if you've got a good conversion rate, um, it's fine. you're not going to be, you know, you don't have to, yeah. don't, don't just think that you have to have like 10, 10 cent bids on it. Um, this question is not PPC related, but it, it, I'm going to mention it because it ties into something PPC related. I, I'll, I'll make the connection here, but somebody was mentioning a, um, one of the previous podcasts where I talked about, like, I personally don't create the listings until I have the products on hand, just so I can like have sales the first day. Now. What is your strategy as far as like, let's say somebody doesn't have a warehouse like I do at my house where I can literally turn my listings on, at least my fulfilled by merchant is available from day one, I can start getting sales. Somebody's just using FBA. Do you tell them, hey, don't make your listing active or and don't start your PPC campaigns until the inventory is distributed like across the country a little bit more? Or, or do you do you want them to start like right away? What, what are you usually uh, advising your clients? Um, I think budget is a little bit of a factor here and how much they're willing to spend up front because another variable that they need to consider again is like reviews and conversion rate. If you have no reviews, are you going to convert better? Probably not. So are you willing to spend that much money up front knowing that your shipping times may be delayed still because your inventory is not spread out? So you may have extended shipping windows, which lowers your conversion rate even further. So someone told me, you know, I'm really, really tight on cash flow. I would probably recommend waiting to start your PPC. If someone's like, hey, you know, we have cash set aside. This is an investment. We need to get going as quick as possible and driving volume. Then it's fine starting from the beginning with a slightly lower conversion rate. All right. Awesome. Uh, Listing creations from YouTube says best five campaigns you can do at launch. It's a fun one. Also, Rick from Lake of the Ozarks is in the chat, and I spent so much of my childhood there. So that just made me laugh. It's like I've never seen anyone in the Amazon community from the Lake of the Ozarks. So it made me where, happy. Where in the world is that? Missouri. It's, oh, I don't know, oh, okay. quite a bit north. Oh, yeah, I see, from I see us. Now, Richard, uh, Richard from Lake. Yeah. Ozark. All right, cool. Uh, best five campaigns you can do at launch. So I personally don't love launching auto campaigns in the beginning because similar to like the honeymoon, honeymoon period, Amazon doesn't quite know what keywords are best for you just yet. So they cast a really wide net and they take your product and show up for a ton of keywords and then start figuring out which customers like. I've done typically great keyword research before launching. So I like to start with... Uh, uh, exact match campaign that's really focused on the keywords I want to rank for that I'm converting best on. I know that they're going to be probably a little bit more expensive and less profitable. So I put them into their own campaign. And then I take those same keywords and I'll put them into a lower bid broad match campaign, which is going to help me collect further long tail keyword research. But it's going to be at much cheaper bids because I probably won't convert just as well on a launch. If you have great video assets, a video ad can be really fantastic as well because it allows you to educate your customer on what's best. If you have an amazing competitive advantage, like maybe your price point's a little bit lower or maybe you have a different flavor or color that no one else has, layering in small product targeting campaigns is great as well. Whether it's sponsored products or sponsored display, just a few product targeting focused on your competitive advantage. Do you have anything else that you would add there, Bradley? No, it's, it's, yeah, to, to me, it's like, I would say that for sure, you know, you, you know, you want to rank for certain keywords Well, you've got to have a camp an exact campaign on, on those keywords. Now, where it might be different is maybe you don't want to rank from day one on your hero keyword just yet, because yeah. it might be too competitive, you know? So in that sense, I might have another campaign where I'm going just on the long, more longer tail versions uh, of the keyword. 
Um, and then maybe bring in the, those hero, uh, hero keywords a little bit later once I have a little bit more reviews. Depends on the yeah. competitive niche. I, I've also had ones recently where I was doing a test where I didn't from day one start with five campaigns. I only was like, hey, I'm going to put all my money because I'm trying to rank for these five keywords. I just had one. I called it like a launch campaign where you know I'm, I'm, I'm really going to be at the top of the search and and that's all I was doing. I wasn't doing broad and 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 auto and stuff. The counterpoint to that would be, I have found you know I, it's it's probably part of like what I call the honeymoon effect, is that newer listings sometimes get more love from the broad and auto campaigns. Like like Amazon just like yeah. throws you, and this could Everything. be a positive or negative thing. But the positive side is like <laughs> you might be getting exposure on keywords that you might be harder to get on an auto or broad campaign a year down the road, and so. That really helps, especially if you're trying to get indexed for like forbidding keywords or other brand name keywords and stuff. So yep. that that would be the the counter of of not you know like for somebody who yeah. says don't do an auto campaign. Yeah, at, at the it really it depends on ways. your budget too. Yeah, I mean if you have a budget to go a little bit more broad, then definitely go broad and collect data quickly. Then just optimize quicker. Sure. But if Absolutely. you don't have budget, then it's like you should probably go really, really small and precise and take your time. And I, that that can be hard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. I got to like the there's next one here is about like three messages long. So we'll <laughs> I just read, read through it. All it. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, was little, I was like, oh, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> the first one says, I launched my product a couple days ago. Congratulations, Ali. Uh, I was able to add 15 to 20 keyword phrases and 30 to 40 single keywords in his listing. I launched a single keyword campaign, which is the main keyword in exact and phrase. And then he launched three other exact match campaigns, each having five keywords. These are my secondary keywords. Uh, I've reached, I've received 600 impressions and two clicks on my ads. Uh, Cerebro is short showing 86 organic keywords and two sponsored. Uh, for, first of all, if you just launched two days ago, it's too early to be running Cerebro. You should be using Keyword Tracker. You know, Cerebro could have, you know, yeah. the numbers are, are just for some lower search volume keywords, maybe are only searched for once a week. So you should be putting everything in, in Keyword Tracker if you just launched. Um, but anyways, uh, what would be your advice? How can I rank for yep. more keywords? So so what about that? Like two, yep. two clicks after two days and 600 impressions? What are your thoughts on, on Really? That? not enough data whatsoever. I mean, industry standard is to get at least 10 clicks a keyword before making a bit optimization decision. So just do some really quick math there. If you're running 40 key 40 keywords in your listing, but maybe you have 10 to 15 keywords in your campaign and then you need to get 10 clicks per keyword, you kind of see where you need to be. Your impressions are low and your clicks are really low, which tells me your bids are probably too low or your keywords aren't relevant. So Amazon, Amazon's not serving your ad because maybe your keywords aren't that relevant. But if they are relevant, go in and maybe increase your bid a little bit and see if you're going to win more impressions. And for those listening in, the bid is so important because it's like bidding on real estate. You want the best real estate with the most traffic and the best views, you just bid higher. If you bid lower, you show up on page two or page three, which can be cheap, but you're not going to get a lot of foot traffic. Yeah. So your bid is a really, really important lever in the beginning. It's what's controlling your impressions and everything else. Yep. Yep. A follow-up question from Elshad. Uh, thank you for the answer for the first question. And he, uh, he or she has another one. What's your strategy when choosing relevant keywords from search term report? Any specific criteria? So, I mean, obviously it, it, <laughs> it depends on what's, you know, what your goals are and everything, yep. but do you have like a, a standard baseline that they usually suggest? Yeah. So I think, uh, thankfully there's a, a decent amount of flexibility when you're setting up like harvesting rules, but in general, the biggest thing I look for, did it drive an order? If it drove an order, regardless of how profitable it is, I can make it profitable through good bid management. So we typically look for, you know, like last 30 days, did it drive two or more orders? If yes, we segmented out, was the ACOS above 50%? If yes, okay, we're gonna put it here, but we're gonna lower the bid. If it was below 20%, it's gonna be in a different campaign, but with a, the same bid that made it successful in the search term report. Because at the end of the day, if a customer bought a product from your ad, the ad did its job, right? 
if the ROAS was bad or the ACOS was bad, your bid can make it better. So you have direct control over that through your bid management. So that's why it's the most important variable. Click the rate conversion rate. I don't care as much about if it's a low conversion rate, just set a low bid. If it's a low click through rate, it's probably a listing issue, not necessarily a keyword issue. Mark says, Atomic doesn't have the ability to toggle top of search percentage. How does the boost function work? Oh, okay, I think I, I think I might have replied to, to Mark in, in Facebook. This is probably what he's replying to. Um, he, if it was him, he had said, hey, I, I want to really work on top of search, but I don't see an Atomic. And I'm like, well, personally, I don't use the top of search modifier because mm -hmm. I just turn on boost and keyword tracker so that I could see where I am showing up in the, the, the sponsored uh, results, but but just in general, what are your yep. um, suggestions for if somebody is or is not going to use the top of search uh, toggle? Atomic does have a top of search toggle. Oh, the, I, so, uh, I, I don't uh, I don't use it, so I don't even know. <laughs> I'll start with <laughs> you know that. better than me, baby. <laughs> Atomic uh, has the the top of search modifiers. The one thing to always remember, and this is outside of Atomic. Um, Placement modifiers are on the campaign level. So if you have 30 keywords in a campaign and then you apply a top of search placement modifier, you don't know when it's being applied. It doesn't 100% be applied to every single click. So I, I throw that out there because it can cause inconsistency in your bid management for any software, any ad console use. So just keep that in mind. We personally use top of search when we're wanting to just turn on high sales. So we typically will create separate campaigns where it's like, this is a top of search campaign and we'll do a small batch of keywords, two to three keywords maybe. And then we'll put an aggressive top of search modifier to help influence that. If you're wanting to just look at the placement results and then make adjustments based on that, that's, that is okay. But remember, it's going to mess with your bid management on the keyword level because if you put 100% top of search, that does not mean every single keyword is going to get a 100% increase. I mean, some keywords might and some might not, which is going to mess up your bid management. Yep. Listing creation says, do you perform campaigns on test products? If so, what's your take? I mean, for me, if I ever do a yeah. test listing, it's only to be PPC. Otherwise, what what is what is the purpose of, of your test? So like I run tests where... I'm not sure if a product idea is going to be good or not, or maybe I'm trying to do something new that there's not enough data. The only way that you can, um, you know, validate your hypothesis is by running PPC. Otherwise, you just put up a listing. That, I mean, there's there's going to be yep. no traffic. Um, do do you ever run uh you like test listings to validate uh new products or anything like that? Um, Destiny. Um, not too frequently. But I, I will throw out uh, the suggested bid and figuring out how expensive your CPCs are can be a pretty important thing to do, right? I get asked all the time, how do I forecast how competitive a category is? And I'm like, well, the best way is to probably look at your suggested bids. And then the follow-up question is suggested bids are always wrong. Don't listen to them. But at the end of the day, suggested bids are an average of every placement on the page. So if you're seeing your suggested bid is seven to $8, that probably means it's going to be pretty competitive to be in the top of search. So I, I think it's important for those reasonings. Yep. Uh, Diksha says, I'm running campaigns in Amazon Italy for badminton shoes. Well, that's a interesting niche right there. But I'm not getting much impressions. Clicks are giving me high A costs. I'm not getting enough data. What should I do? This is a this is a difficult one because you're not getting much impressions. How do you get more impressions? You increase your bid. But if you increase your bid, your A cost is going to get worse. So it sounds like the best answer is you need to figure out how to improve your conversion rate or go after more long tail keywords. Maybe you're selling men's badminton shoes and you should focus on being more precise and targeting men's. Knowing what the international marketplace is, it probably is just a really low search volume category that's pretty dang niche, it sounds like, and apparel's a little bit difficult. So the, the biggest thing is probably zeroing in on more precise keyword research that's going to be cheaper CPCs and higher conversion rate. What's the best thing you've implemented as a PPC agency? That's a broad question there. <laughs> uh, 
uh, for us, I think it's investing in more creative across sponsored brands and sponsored display. But we work with a lot of brand builders. So we're focusing a lot on like the creative aspects. I think everyone kind of wants a magic trick from a bid optimization, lower taco standpoint. At the end of the day, like every software out there, right, provides similar bid methodology. So it's not like one is doing something that the other's not. So it's really being a lot more strategic with how you're segmenting your campaign. So you have more control than focusing on your differentiation and building a better brand. Taylor says, is it worth creating PPC campaigns for FBM products or should you only have ads on FBA products? I think it's definitely beneficial. Uh, COVID was a really good catalyst for this. Everyone was switching back and forth really quickly. Uh, the one thing I will say is we don't actually recommend putting um, both your FBA and FBM SKU or ASIN in a campaign. We recommend separating them out because typically your FBA has a quicker shipping time. So your conversion rate is almost always higher than your FBM. So if you put them together and then switch back and forth, the moment you go from FBA to FBM, your conversion rate is going to drop and you're going to have to lower all of your bids and it's going to mess with the historical performance of your campaign. But if you create FBM campaigns, you can lower your bids knowing your conversion rate is probably going to be lower and still see the same A cost that you would with mm, your other campaigns. Good point, good point. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Like, I, <laughs> I, got I, thrown I into dual list everything just because Co I have my own COVID warehouse. Hit. <laughs> and then that's a good point. Like, you know, if, if Amazon puts my inventory on transfer or something, you know, then the buy box goes to the FBM, but then my bids are still at the FBA rate. But that's, that's a good point to have separate, mm -hmm. separate campaigns for each. And it's not like I'm, I'm bidding against myself or something. Only the yeah. one that has the buy box is, is the one that is going to get the, uh, the clicks. Very good uh, point. Um, let's see here. The Lone Wolf says, <laughs> I'm not tech savvy enough to know how to really analyze my PPC. I, th I think this is why yeah. PPC is such a beast to, to people new to to it, you know, on Amazon. It's like, um, you know, the, the thing that everybody wants to outsource from day one. I've always said, I think you should outsource to agencies and things like that when you, you're at the level where you just, you know, don't have the bandwidth, yeah. but you got to know how to do it yourself first. But people are like, oh my goodness, where do I even start? Yeah. To learn so like for newer sellers who have never done something like pay-per-click before how should they start to tackle what's some just basics i guess you could tell them yeah i i think uh the the two biggest things that you really have to understand is bid management you'll hear us talk about this all the time and it's not complex you know i know there's a lot of different people in the space saying like there's a magic solution or we have an ai algorithm for bidding or this or this or this but no it's it's not that at the end of the day, again, it's it's that real estate model. You have a high bid, you're showing up at the top of the page. If you cannot afford that placement, you lower your bid, you lower traffic, but you have a better ACOS ROAS. And it takes a lot of testing to, to figure that out. I mean, I think it took me like three years, two and a half years of managing before bid management clicked and I could do it intuitively by hand. Um, there is a ton of content online. I've put together some really simple videos on like how I learned bid management when I was starting. Uh, Amazon has a great accreditation course I'm going to throw out here. It's not very technical, but it's very high level, which helps you kind of understand the principles of bid management. And this is also why I would say like software is important. Not everyone's a math person, right? Not everyone's going to be able to build the analytics to do this. But when you have a super simple software that's just applying bid management for you, you can then focus on maybe keyword targeting and creative and some of the things that maybe you're best at. And there's also PPC Academy, which will be having some new modules uh, yeah. soon on and Freedom Ticket has some good basics. If you're a Helium 10 member, just hop in there and check those out as well. Janik says, if you launch a listing on day one and put really high bids in PPC, Will you show up as sponsored products on page one, or do you have to give Amazon time to figure out your listing? It typically takes some time. We, I wouldn't recommend this. We've tested this on our own, like from an agent, agency perspective with some of our larger brands. Sometimes we'll set like a $49 bid on one exact match keyword just to force it to the top of the page. And then when it gets clicks pretty quickly. Amazon realizes it's relevant because customers are clicking when they see it. 
and then I can lower my bid back down and I will get more impressions and traffic. Cause again, it's an algorithm, right? Amazon needs data to make a decision. So once they see people are clicking and they like that ad, you'll get more relevancy. Um, but it's sometimes dependent on the category. Like in supplements, we've seen that a brand new launch can take four to five days before we are really getting the maximum amount of impressions. So we do, we like to start with high bids to collect data quick and then optimize back down. But again, if you can't afford that in the beginning, just take your time and maybe be a little bit more profitable and start with lower bids. And then once you slowly start gaining the clicks and the traffic, then you can scale up. Matt says, I've got a two variation listing. The product which sells the least is always shown in the search results. Should the best selling child ASIN be showing instead? What's going on here? Um, I think there's a few different variables and Bradley, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, but I think it's probably looking at click through rate. What is driving the highest click through rate? Um, that can be a, a reason Amazon wants to show the product that's getting the most clicks, knowing that you're bringing them into the listing, even if they purchase another product, that's one of the variables. Do you have any insight into this? Yeah, there, there's a couple things here. First of all, Amazon is not perfect. Um, you know, you, I, I've seen cases where, where the, uh, what is it called? Amazon's choice is on a product that I know for a fact is one of the, you know, is not converting for that, 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 that keyword. So, so Amazon algorithm is not always perfect. That being said, you've got some data also in like search query performance. I would look at the ASIN level of in search query performance, and you can find out, uh, at least, uh, generally at the keyword level, which uh, child item is, you know, does have a good conversion rate. Like destiny was saying, you know, like maybe you don't realize it maybe may, you know, may, maybe the overall, the sales for one product or for one, uh, listing, uh, child item is higher than the other, but for that particular keyword, the conversion rates killer on the other one, it's just not getting as much traffic, you know? So, so that could be a case too. So I would look at both of those things. Uh, best video creation asset for video campaigns. I mean, people can go 3d, people can go AI, mm -hmm. people can do agencies, uh, yeah. photography studios, all of the above. What do you suggest? Advertising console has its own video builder as well. A lot of people aren't fully aware of. So I always recommend like, if you have absolutely no budget, start there. And then if it performs well, you can then create custom videos for you. Um, it really it depends on how much you're willing to spend, you know, uh, at the end of the day, Amazon sponsor brands video is a cost per click model. So if you put a terrible video up there, customers aren't going to click on it. Right. Yep. Uh, so that's a really good reasoning for like lower risk and whatever videos you're throwing up there. But I would say at the end of the day, Amazon video is getting more competitive. So you do need a fantastic video and you should align it with the type of targeting you're wanting to do. If you're going more broad in your category, your video probably needs to be more educational. If you're going really precise, kids soccer ball for girls, then you should probably create a video where you have little athletes that are playing with the soccer ball, right? So it's a broad question. Yeah. Douda says, creating long tail keywords in phrase match campaign, should you use both as an example, diamond gold shoe for women, or should I just use diamond gold shoe? I would use both. I don't think it hurts to use both. You don't have to worry about internal competition. Uh, you're going to win precisely for women when you add that term. So it could be really profitable for you. And then the other one may be a little bit more broad. You may be targeting men and women, so it may not convert as well, depending on who your shoe is for but it doesn't hurt to test both. Trab says, hello again from Berlin. After being indexed for a keyword, changing the listing affects the index keywords. Is it resetting the index one? So I would have to put them again into the listing. So I, in my experience, th this can go both ways. You know, first of all, I, what I always tell people is if you have a really good performing keyword, like it's an important keyword for you and you are ranking high organically, and maybe that keyword is in phrase form in your title. Don't mess with that. <laughs> don't, you know, don't touch that. You know, if, if you need to change some of your title, like change other words, but don't mess what's working uh, for you. Now, where about when we're talking about indexing, 
you know, like you technically can be indexed for keywords that you don't even have in your listing. And actually that's through PPC usually like, like, you know, maybe you do a broad campaign uh, or an auto campaign and Amazon can show you for whatever you want or whatever yeah. they want, even though you don't even have that keyword in your listing. And then what happens when you get a conversion for that, then a lot of times, yes, you're indexed and now you can do a manual campaign against that keyword. But um, yeah, in, in general, my philosophy is if you have a good performing keyword uh, and it's in <laughs> phrase form in your listing, don't, don't, yeah. don't mess with it. You know, don't, don't take that, that chance. Uh, any, any kind of like indexing tips you can, you can give us that have to do with PPC at all? I think it, it's just going back to the basics and not overthinking it right on our end. We look for, what are we converting best on? I think, you know, one of the favorite questions in the Helium 10 group is always along the lines of how can I tell what keywords I'm driving sales for organically, right? And on the Amazon advertising side, we can see that through a search term report. So using your search term report to really understand where you convert best. So like if I'm selling protein, maybe I think the majority of my purchasers are buying men's protein, but then I go into my search term report and I realize that the most, the highest conversion rate terms are women's vegan protein. That tells me I can adjust my listing to focusing on women in my target audience. And once you find those placements where you have a higher conversion rate, you're going to rank better for those terms because your conversion rate's better. Amazon can see that when people click on your listing, they want to buy for those keywords. So it's kind of the rising tide lifts all ships. Mm -hmm. Cable says, uh, could you speak about weekly or ongoing optimization practices or workflow for managing a large catalog? I'm largely a Canadian seller and I have over a hundred active listings. So a lot of campaigns to manage. Yeah. Uh, I think there's three things that are really important here. One, having amazingly clean campaign naming system for every one product we personally have, um, ranking campaigns, branded campaigns, profitability campaigns, competitor conquesting campaigns across sponsor products, sponsor brand, sponsor display. So we typically have one ASIN and we'll have 20 to 30 campaigns, right? So we had to have a really clean naming system. Every single campaign, we have the ASIN in the name, the product identifier, so you can easily filter on your own, the strategy behind it, and then the keyword research technique. Once you have that, you can then take your search term report and easily harvest keywords every month. You can say, hey, last 30 days, filter by this ASIN. Here's all my new keywords that I want to reinvest in. Uh, the same thing from a bid management perspective. I think anytime you get above $50,000 a month in revenue, you should probably be working with either a software bid management or bulk uploads bid management system. Um, just from a consistency sake, like that is a must have. And then the keyword research harvesting side, like I said, if you have clean naming, you could either rely on a software for that or just use bulk uploads and macros to help build out a good harvesting system. But your structure and organization is going to be the most important part. Shirley from Atlanta says, what's a typical budget you guys have on a new launch? Our product price is the 10, oh, that's a pretty big range right there, but a 10 to $25 <laughs> uh, range. Still a lower price point product, I would say, which is mm -hmm. always really difficult. Uh, we've seen budgets from $10,000 a month on PPC to $500 a month. It, you know, I, I don't love this question because it's dependent on your category. It, yeah. You could be in supplements and need over a hundred grand for a really successful launch, but it's not necessary. Like the value of Amazon advertising is that you can start small. You can start with a hundred dollars a month and then scale up as needed. You may not compete or drive near as many sales as the competitors, but maybe you can afford that, right? So you really need to consider how much budget you're willing to spend and then work backwards from that or consider what your category is doing. Kurt's got a good one here. Uh, if you've got a seasonal product, what do you do with your campaigns for your product out of the season? Well, this is the value of a pay-per-click model. If you sell snowmen and it's the middle of summer, people probably aren't clicking on your ads. So the nature of Amazon advertising does typically reflect seasonality. The biggest thing you need to consider is your conversion rate decreasing. 
So if your conversion rate decreases, you probably need to lower your bids during your off season. If your conversion rate is increasing as you're leading into your in season, then you go ahead and increase your bids to reflect that. This is something that I would say softwares aren't fantastic at. Softwares typically only look at last 30 days of performance. So let's say I'm selling beach towels and it's almost June. Um, my software is going to look at the last three to 60 days and be like, let's keep bids low. And it's almost too reactive, but you know, you're going into season. So let's go ahead and increase our bids because we know our conversion rate is going to be higher than you can capture that traffic up front. Unbeatable Game says, are impressions always visible on your screen or can they appear off screen and still be counted? Always visible on screen. Um, the attribution models are a little bit different. Like a view CPM campaign is just a one second view, I believe. And I think there's differences across all of them, but they're on screen. I don't even know the answer to this. I think you can. Lewis says, can you use Atomic with vendor central advertising campaigns? I'm not positive. I think you can, but for sure, PackView, mm -hmm. you can do for a vendor uh, central. But you maybe Atomic as well, Lewis. I believe you can. Okay. Uh, cable again. Every time I see this name, I just want to call him the cable guy. Jim Carrey <laughs> in the movie. Uh, we were talking about movies earlier today. You got to watch Blended. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, Destiny. That's a classic, classic movie. Have you tested or seen value or detriment to duplicating campaigns for variations? You can capture more real estate, uh, yet does it inflate costs unnecessarily? What other considerations? Now, hold on. If you, I, In organic search results, in most categories, you can't have two organic in, in the same yeah. page, but in if you have two campaigns for two colors, can both of those show up on page page one? Okay, no, that's, not, about, uh, that, that's why I made a face there. Oh, yeah. like, wait a minute, did something new happen here? In we've seen it tested like three times in the last six hundred days, where they will let you show up in multiple real estate. We we don't see any any detriment to duplicating campaigns in full transparency. We've also tested that even with separate um, listings. Like if you have a chocolate protein and a vanilla protein in separate listings, we do this. We win more share of uh, share of shelf for that reason. Um, it doesn't inflate costs. You won't compete directly for your CPCs. You will be paying for advertising to placement. So when you're considering whether or not to vary or not to vary, you definitely need to consider your PPC cost. But you are correct, Bradley. Um, follow up question from Diksha about she was on from Italy. Um, so long tail keyword should be an exact broader phrase or, or perhaps all of the above. I run them in all of the above, but I have really good bid management. If you don't have fantastic good bid management, probably start with exact match. So that way you can be a little bit more selective with what you're targeting. Cause sometimes when you go into broad match, it may not convert as well. Cause if I'm selling men's shoes, and it's being served to a women, women aren't going to be happy to click on that and figure out they don't have a women's variation. They're not going to buy it. Yeah. Vivu Wen says keyword targeting helps to rank keywords, sponsored keyword and organic keywords. But what about, I'm assuming he means ASIN targeting uh, rank four. If I only run ASIN targeting, do I have organic sales? Now, mm -hmm. let me ask you this. Like somebody could do an ASIN targeting campaign yeah. And then maybe that ad follows them around. Eventually it could show up even in search results, right? Yeah. Yeah. ASIN targeting isn't exclusively showing up on the product detail page. There's some level of behavior-based targeting associated with ASIN targeting from everything that we've seen. But everything that drives a sell for you is going to help your organic rank typically, right? It, it, the difference is a keyword targeting from an algorithm perspective is really precise and a lot easier. You bid on protein, you drive a sell for protein, you send Amazon a signal that you should be ranked for protein. It's a really easy path, right? And sponsored keyword ads drive over 70% of sales. So what's going to drive the most volume for you? Keyword targeting. What's going to improve your organic rank the most? Keyword targeting. Will product targeting still help? Yes, absolutely. But it may not give you as much ranking juice as what keyword targeting would. 
Martin says we're selling ink cartridges with our own brands in Germany. Very competitive. We've got great reviews. Uh, we were always on top. Now Chinese sellers are pushing us out with better PPC. How can we get back on top? What campaigns and what would you recommend? I'm going to take a, take a risk here and say that they're not potentially running better PPC than you. They're probably just willing to accept a much lower margin. Truly, like uh, it's m typically more philosophical one, you know, from a manufacturing cost perspective, they can probably wiggle a little bit cheaper than what you can. So maybe they have inherent higher margins. But what we see in this situation typically is there's like this level of economies of scale. I think Chinese sellers would rather sell 10,000 units and only make a dollar in every unit versus smaller sellers that are maybe not smaller sellers. That's not the appropriate term, but sellers who have been on the platform for a while typically would rather say are focused on just only margin up front. So they're like overly focused on profit and that profit decreases when your total revenue goes down and ends up hurting you. So I, I would say like the biggest thing is to be more competitive, show up on more top of search campaigns, improve your conversion rate. That's usually a big value add. I think for um, brands is you can optimize your listing a little bit better and maybe better for your audience. So focus on those assets and getting your creative in place and winning top of search placements because you probably have a review advantage, it sounds like, and be willing to maybe take a little bit more of a loss up front, knowing that you're going to get better organically. Dauda says, I've got a hard time deciding what to do with my search term report for my phrase match campaigns. TT ad, TT ad revenue, TikTok, what? Ad revenue is 12,000 per month. 6,000 is gen, there, there's no keyword. I'm thinking is it product targeting ad revenue. Maybe, yeah, maybe product targeting and then Hold on, I gotta... Let me read this again. I know. I was 6, like, I got to scroll. From keywords that have, oh, from keywords that have one to two clicks max, one sale, good impressions, A cost is over 40% and my listings are good. Hmm. The uh, biggest thing I can recommend is... You're always going to have keywords with one to two clicks, like at the end of the day. I think that's pretty standard in this space. So potentially lower your bids if you can't afford those or turn them off and only focus on exact match or realize that those one to two sales end up adding up over time. Since yeah. you're saying that your A cost is over 40%, like I would maybe just lower your bids, but you don't really have enough data to make that decision. We let them run in the majority of our campaigns. If I'm only solely focused on profitability, maybe you pause and only switch to exact match so you can have more control. Reza says, what keyword types, broad phrase, et cetera, are most effective for video and display advertising campaigns? Display does not have match types, keyword types. Just ASINs. Mm -hmm. um, a Video has match types, but our agency data year to date in Q1 has almost the same A cost across every match type because we optimize our bids per match type. Our broad match has a slightly lower conversion rate than our exact match because it's more broad again. So as mentioned, we lower our bids for our broad match keywords. So that, that's why I'm struggling to answer this because really the outcome of all of them is dependent on your bid management. If you have good bid management, then they're all going to be profitable. So at the end of the day, if you're solely focused on profitability, exact match, it's the, typically one of the highest converting broad match if you want keyword research and more sales, but it needs to be ran a lower bid. Those ones get me. Like I want to give everyone a clear and concise answer, but... All right. Moreshi says product is <laughs> socks, which is yep. competitive, high cost per click. I'm struggling between ranking versus keeping the A cost low and product profitable. Oh, great question. I don't mind investing initially. Long term payoff is what I'm looking for. Suggestions. Create campaigns for both. Like 
this is one of the biggest recommendations I have in this situation. You create one campaign for ranking with high CPCs. You create the exact same campaign and the same keywords for profitability and a low ACOS. And if I'm bidding on socks with a $10 bid and socks for a $2 bid, they're not both winning. Your $10 bid typically wins until you run out of budget and then your other campaign will kick in. And what this allows you to do is move your budget how you need to. If one week you can spend more on ranking, spend more on ranking. If one week you need to be more profitable, you move your budget to your profitability focused campaigns. This helps you see the difference in performance for both of them, right? You can control your ACOS here and you can increase your budget as needed while still investing in your ranking campaign, regardless of how much budget you have. Okay. Excellent. Vivu says, hey, Bradley, hope to see you soon in Hanoi. I was literally just in Ho Chi Minh last week. <laughs> Didn't get to do any meetings. Have you been to Vietnam yet, uh, Destiny? I have not. Oh, it's amazing, amazing. So, so, it's, it's tough to get a visa, but but it, it's 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 a so everything is so inexpensive and really great services over there. And now I love Vietnam so much. I bought a Vietnamese car in California. I drive a Vinfast VF8. Uh, I now. love that. <laughs> <laughs> Two hundred and forty nine dollars a month with zero down lease. Oh my goodness, that's Electric crazy. Car. Love it. Um, <laughs> Richard says, "Is everybody in your agency?" <laughs> as product savvy and knowledgeable as you in your agency. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what he means, but Kevin, Kevin King and I just recorded a podcast. I don't think it's been released yet on the, well, not on this topic, but we did talk uh, very in depth about this. And my high level answer is, you know, scaling an agency is really difficult, but if you follow my team on LinkedIn, they actually do post as much content as I do. And they're very, very strategic. Uh, so I would say, yeah, I, I think I educate a little bit better because I'm constantly doing this and talking to brands and maybe breaking things down in a more simple manner. But our whole team is very strategic and has been doing this for like five years. Zal says, how important is a store page on Amazon? Do customers actually check it? And then I guess a follow-up question for me would be um, when you're doing your your sponsor brand campaigns, You know, one of the options I believe is, is to send people to store page as opposed to a product collection, where are you sending most of your sponsored brand uh, campaigns to? Fantastic question. I'm actually was going to see if I can pull up some of ours real quick. Uh, in general, it's not a ton of traffic, but there definitely is traffic, especially for larger brands, right? Who have a brand presence, maybe they're in a retail store or something like that. They're going to get a lot of traffic. We've seen some really, really strong store page performance. And I'm going to try to pull it up. But if you don't have a lot of search volume under your branded name, no, you're, you're probably not going to get as much traffic. Uh, to Bradley's point about where we drive our landing pages, we typically recommend creating a sponsored brand ad and driving to the product detail pages because it's easy, clean, and concise. Like if someone's typing for this, they click this ad, I want them to be able to check out. But let's say I am Nike or Adidas, right? And I have multiple products and I bid on the term soccer equipment. That's a scenario where you probably want to drive them to your store page that has your shin guards and your cleats and your socks and your shirts because it's more broad and it's more awareness focused. So it's really dependent on the search. If they type in shin guards, I'm driving them to a landing page of all of my shin guards. If they go a little bit more broad, I'm going to drive them to my store page. In the meantime, I do have one of our pages opened up. This is a large brand, so it's not a great example. But in the last 30 days, they have 70,000 visitors hmm. and 63 seconds is the average dwell time and over a million views through that. So it's kind of something to keep in mind, like definitely customers use store pages, but it's probably skewed towards large brands where they're actually searching by brand name. Janik says, if you're targeting only three exact keywords with high bids for a new listing, will being FBM deter the ranking from still showing it? If you're asking if it's just the fact that it's FBM, not per se, like if you're being penalized 
or having FBM. No, I mean, that's the kind of thing that the FTC would definitely <laughs> jump on, you know, of, of what they're investigating Amazon for. But it was what Destiny was talking about earlier. Uh, your, if, if you have a category where everybody's FBM, like sofas or something like that, or refrigerators, well, you know, everybody's in the same boat. But maybe you're in a category where everybody's selling these water bottles and you're the only FBM seller and everybody else is FBA, you're not going to get a good click-through rate. You're not going to get a good conversion rate because people are going to see, oh, shipping time four days or five days or, or something like that. And, and everybody else, same day delivery or next day delivery, they'll have a better uh, rate, uh, you know, conversion rate. And um, that means that they'll yep. rank, you know, b uh, better than you. Um, anything to add uh, to that? No, your your context provided though was super, super valuable here. <laughs> it's super easy to like correlate things, especially as a brand owner when you don't see multiple categories, but then you you kind of have to zoom out like Bradley said, and you know, it's more of a conversion rate issue than anything else. Diksha says, how much does A plus content help uh, in PPC or the algorithm? There is no A10 algorithm, just A9 algorithm. <laughs> how much focus should a listing give to A plus from PPC. So is there any correlation at all other than just the fact that it might help conversion rate a little bit more when they get on the page? But have I, you seen any other con uh, correlation? I think conversion rate is the biggest piece here. Mm -hmm. Like you need to stand out. And if you just think about the path a customer takes, almost all customers scroll down to look at a review. And during that scroll time is where you have a lot of opportunity to showcase why your product is better than everyone else's. And the better that product converts, the better your Amazon advertising is going to perform. Okay. We have a couple minutes, a uh, couple minutes left here. How do we get more external clicks for Amazon listings? We heard that this also drives organic listings. Some Amazon cam campaigns also try yep. external traffic. So are, are you, do you think people should be, you know, doing Google ads, Facebook ads to get that external traffic, TikTok ads or what? I think all of them are super powerful. Um, at the end of the day, Amazon can only fit so many more sponsored placements in the search results. So they're like, how do we capture more traffic? Right. And it's by incentivizing people taking external providers and sending that traffic to Amazon. So external traffic is definitely important. You have Amazon attribution, which is going to help you somewhat track that traffic. At the end of the day, conversion rate is still an important lever, though. Uh, for example, if I sell if I sell hand lotion and I'm paying for a Google ad on hand lotion, and they go to Amazon, but they weren't necessarily wanting to buy, maybe they were wanting to watch a video on why my hand lotion was better, and that conversion rate is low. It's probably not going to improve your organic rank. So it, there's a million different variables to this question. This could be its own webinar. We do recommend driving external traffic and building a brand off platform. You can use Amazon DSP, you can use TikTok or Google, but as with everything, make sure that traffic's converting. All right, one question for you, for me is um, something I have, even though I've been using Atomic for years, um, I haven't started doing the schedules or the day parting yet. Yeah. So just in general, you know, like whether somebody's yeah, using yeah, yeah. Atomic or another software that um, allows you to do day parting. First of all, what are what kind of metrics are you looking at? Like, are you looking at days of the week, uh, times of day? And then what are you looking at in whatever you yeah. uh, answer that question with uh, to actually kind of, uh, you know, base what you're doing off of like are you yeah. like actually turning off ads or just lowering bids if, if there's a high a cost time of day or something this um, is one of my favorite yeah. topics kurt also has a great question around helium 10 that i want to get to after this one but uh, overall if anyone's followed me for a while they probably have heard my spiel on day parting and i'm going to start with that and then i'm going to go into kind of the specifics here Historically, I was always really against day parting because there is a hundred different data points and insights that say when a customer clicks on an ad, they don't typically buy a product immediately. So why that's important to understand is because maybe your sales look terrible Sunday at midnight. Maybe you have a ton of clicks, but no sales. What's probably happening is the customers are adding to cart Sunday at midnight and not checking out until Monday or Tuesday. So if you turn off your PPC on Sunday because you think you're not getting sales, 
you're just turning off the sales you were going to get on Tuesday. Across the board, the majority of customers do not buy the moment they click. Amazon's released that. We Other than me. It. like, like I, I thought everybody is like me. I literally do not buy anything yeah, unless it's right. And then I found <laughs> out that, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Like most people are not like me, I guess. Yes. So when people are looking at their ad console on Monday, they're being like, my performance is terrible. I'm turning off ads on Monday. And all they're effectively doing is just shutting off spend in general. Now, that being said, Amazon's released a new API called Amazon Marketing Stream. This was released in the last 36 months. This is important to understand because only software providers really have access to this API. And what this API gives us is the ability to see the time a click was made and the time that sale was driven. Adtomic has that ability and those insights and they're showing you that data. So for the first time ever, we can see that correlation. Now we have enough data to optimize for those time periods. We've played around as an agency with like billions of rows of data here. And the key callouts that we typically see are, you know, sales are low in the morning. ACOS is high at 2 a.m. But at the end of the day, your spend is also insanely low. So, yes, it does work using day parting with Amazon Marketing Stream through a tool like Adtomic, but it typically drives like an incremental difference. I call this out because Ad Console also provides you with day parting now but they do not give you the data that is needed. Like I just said, if you're making optimizations based off advertising console, you're not working with the appropriate set of data. You don't know when a customer clicked on the ad. You only know when the sale was portrayed in ad console. So you're missing out on a huge portion of data. If I were to effectively run day parting though, to your point, what I would do is focus on bid management and not turning off campaigns for this exact reason. Cool. Mm. Which question were you talking yes. about? Kurt said, will Helium 10 come out with a tool to avoid cannibalization for sponsored and high ranked organic search terms? Um, PackView offers this. And that's the reason I was going to shout it out. Helium 10 gives you the insight to be able to optimize with this. The problem with building a tool for it is it's really dependent on your personal needs. For example, if you're not ranked number one, then I don't necessarily think you should completely turn off ads because if you're two, three, or four, it's very often that you're in the bottom carousel. If you're five through eight, you're definitely not ranked high enough to completely turn off ads, right? So there's a little bit of flexibility that I don't think is needed within Helium 10 in this regards. I do know PackView already has this tool from a cannibalization perspective. The other answer here is to push your other products that are already top of search. So, it, I mean, it's really not insanely difficult to build yourself since Helium 10 already gives you the data of where you're ranked organically and you can see everything tied within Atomic. Atomic, it's pretty easy to build out your own internal SOPs with that. That was my long spiel. Excellent, excellent. All right. Um, last question of the day. Ooh, a this quick is great. one here. Oh, I can hop into Best the last tips. one. Wait, no, hop into the last one. Oh, hop into the, the, from the yeah. same person. Main difference between Helium well. 10 and PackView, even though Helium 10 is powered by PackView. I, uh, when we say powered by PackView, I think it's really more so the development teams in the back end. It's the speed of improvements. It's the technical capabilities. At the end of the day, there are two very different tools. Uh, PackView is for the user, in my opinion, that is a power user that is going to be solely using PackView every single day. Um, it's someone who needs to understand share a voice, who needs to understand cannibalization on your own, um, keywords, incrementality. It's very powerful. It's for the user who needs to look at AMC and DSP, right? If your full-time job is Amazon advertising, then PackView is probably the best bet. Helium 10, on the other hand, in my opinion, is really for the brand owner who needs to balance efficiency and systems, but isn't going to be an advanced expert at Amazon advertising. So it's create it's built a lot more efficiently from a user interface perspective and also from a scalable fashion. I think it gives you what you need to know. Awesome. All right, uh Destiny, how can people find you on the interwebs out there if they want to follow up with you or your agency? Uh probably LinkedIn's the best bet, better media or just check Destiny Wishon with the interesting spelling in my name. 
Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Destiny. And if, if you guys are wanting more uh, general questions and learn about my latest launch, hop over right now on YouTube. I'm literally going to go live in about 30 seconds on YouTube or LinkedIn um, or our Facebook groups for a, a second AMA session with just myself. So thank you, Destiny. And I'll be seeing you in a couple weeks, hopefully. Amazing. Thank you, guys.